Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, hi everyone. Welcome back to my course on developing soft skills and personality. This is week 7, module number 2 and lecture number 38. So, this week I have already started the discussion on nonverbal communication and in this module particularly we will focus on some of the basic issues associated with nonverbal communication and the types of nonverbal communication. Before I go to the lecture as such, I would like to give a quick review of what I did in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, I highlighted the importance of nonverbal communication and I started with the definition that nonverbal communication is simply communication without words, which is communication using images, symbols, signs, gestures, facial expressions, postures, etc. Body language. Uh, is more important because it speaks louder than the verbal language. And I talked to you about uh, Mehrabian's uh, discovery in this regard, where uh, he uh, says that 93 percent of communication effectiveness is determined by body language. Why? Because nonverbal messages communicate emotions and nonverbal messages are harder to hide and consciously control. So, they are more accurate indicators of how a person feels. The most important part of the previous lecture was about the uh, discussion with regard to the functions of nonverbal communication. I discussed about five basic functions. Uh, one, repeat what is said verbally. Nonverbal communication complements or clarifies verbal meaning it can contradict verbal meaning, it can regulate verbal interaction and it can also act as a substitute for verbal meaning. Towards the end, I discuss the debate whether it is nature or nurture. Uh, while there are some universal qualities, uh, behavior in terms of uh, possessing our territory, we tend to behave like uh, animals and birds. But then uh, the contemporary view in terms of nonverbal communication is that it can be nurtured, that is the desired behavior can be learnt and cultivated. So, I ended the lecture with a positive note that you can also develop, cultivate nonverbal communication and become an expert. Now, what are the issues associated with nonverbal communication? Why should you be so concerned as well as worried about it? Now, nonverbal communication has two aspects. We can divide them basically into the voluntary body language and the involuntary body language. Now, the voluntary body language has no issues, no problem. Why? Because they refer to movement, gestures and poses which are intentionally made by the person such as smiling shaking hands or imitating actions. Suppose somebody says bye, you will also say bye okay. and it comes to you naturally, you imitate and then it is like you do with the realization of the fact that you are communicating. Somebody is saying bye, so you also want to respond to the person. This is less commonly discussed even in terms of nonverbal communication because it seems unproblematic. There is no problem in doing this voluntary body language. Many type of soundless communication actually come under this category, especially the formalized gestures like saying namaste even in Indian culture that is actually a voluntary body language. So, the person decides to welcome someone and says namaste. Now, as I said this part has actually no issue, it is not really problematic. The actual problem comes with the involuntary body language. Now, what are involuntary body movements or body language? Now, these are the ones that may give observers cues about what one is really thinking or feeling. What does it mean? It is giving them some indicators that what you are feeling inside 
it's not being expressed through the words, but the body is trying to convey that. Now, for the person who is looking at it, the ability to interpret such movements may itself be unconscious, at least for the untrained observers. However, involuntary body language is the most accurate way into a person's subconscious. What is thought in the deep subconscious mind can be revealed through the involuntary body movements. That is why it is problematic, it is sometimes scary, it is uh, sometimes making us feel nervous because without our knowledge, we betray ourselves, our innermost thoughts. So, what do interrogators and uh, customs examiners do? Whenever they want to seek information, which people do not want to give normally, they just look at the body language, okay, they put them into scrutiny, okay, they observe the body language. The simple example is that if you are uh, having a proper ticket and then you are coming out, you are decently dressed and you never ever think of travelling on a train without a ticket. At the entrance, the ticket collector is standing and then when you go, he is not even bothering to ask you about the ticket, but when then somebody amidst the crowd is slightly trying to sneak away and he exactly catches that person without the ticket. How is it possible for the ticket collector to identify among thousands of people the exactly one person? who is coming there without the ticket. So, that is again because of the body language. The person is nervous, the person is trying to hide, the person is trying to sneak away, the person is trying to run away and then he is uh, feeling embarrassed. So, these are indicated in the form of sweat, in the form of uh, uh, some kind of nervousness or other indicated in the moment. So, all the things give clue. So, that is why the major issue about body language is with regard to the involuntary body language. Now, if that sounds like a bad news, the good news is that as it was said in the beginning, they are controllable, provided you become conscious and you become aware of it. Okay. So, that let us see how you can do. And one more uh, issue that I should highlight before actually I get into the types of nonverbal communication is the fact about appearance the way you look. So, the way you look is not necessarily coming from your uh, skin tone, your facial expressions, but also by the way you are uh, using clothing, hairstyle, etcetera. Appearance conveys nonverbal impressions that affect receivers' attitudes towards the verbal messages even before they hear the message. As it is being said, the first impression very often is the best impression and people form the impression even without even the person starts speaking to them. So, even before they hear the message, they form the impression based on the way a person has clothed, based on the person's hat style, the overall neatness, the cosmetics etcetera which are used, which are all part of the personal appearance. What is the issue here? People who are attractive, okay, again mind you, not necessarily in terms of looking good, looking beautiful, looking handsome, but you can make yourself attractive today by grooming yourself okay, in a very pleasant manner. So, those people who appear to be attractive or judged to be more intelligent, more capable and more desirable than others. Now, the interesting fact is that this is not corroborated by any fact, okay, there is no factual basis, but it can affect decisions about hiring, placement and promotion. So, people who generally project themselves as uh, looking good in terms of appearance, looking smart in terms of appearance, whether they really deliver goods or not. There is a human tendency to promote them, even hire them. The people may regret later, that is a different thing. 
but this is a factor that you should keep in mind. Now, what is the success formula then? You develop the inner core, the inner content okay, and then develop all good habits of success, but at the same time pay attention to the outer core also, the appearance also. So, this makes you a very difficult combination and then uh, others will not be able to uh, even match up with you in terms of your uh, projection of yourself, especially in terms of body language. Now, having discussed about these issues, let us look at the types of nonverbal communication and uh, generally you think that nonverbal communication, it simply means you think that oh, it is just body language. Now, what are the aspects of this body language? What are the types? The first one is kinesics, which is coming from the word kinetic, kinesthetics, which implies any kind of movement. Okay. Kinetic itself is indicating movement. So, kinesics is indicating the study of body movement and gesture. Okay. In a sense, it indicates part or the whole of the body movement, okay. the entire body movement the body language itself is called as kinesics. The next important type we need to focus on is facial expression. What can the face do as such? Okay, it can work millions, the eyes can do what words cannot do, the lips can do what again words cannot do. So, what eye in terms of eye gaze it will do? is considered to be oculistics okay, or the science or study of the movement of eye is oculistics. And next we have haptics, haptics refers to touch, the study of touch including handshake, patting, hugging. Okay, so, all these will come under touch. The next one is proxemics, which is close to touch. This is about the study of the use of interpersonal space, how much space we give when we do not know somebody and how much space we reduce when somebody is becoming closer and closer to us, that is proxemics. Chronemics is another interesting aspect of body language, nonverbal communication, that is about our use of time or rather about our misuse of time also. In fact, you will know the misuse of time when you know what kind of chronemics that you come under. We look at it very soon. The last but not the least, the less said about aspect of nonverbal communication is to do with paralinguistics. Okay. The aspect of language which is not using words but giving vocal cues and also silence. Let us look at these aspects in detail with some appropriate examples. Now, first about kinesics that is the part or whole body movement. The science of kinesthetics or body language can be very revealing. What you should do? You should start watching people in terms of their body language. So, watching people's actions can bring you a lot closer to the truth than merely listening to what they say, what might be a cover up also. In short, the outward expressions of inner feelings, especially expressed in the form of moving the body. So, it can be posture, it can be gesture, it can be the way one walks, the way one sits. So, how the person is using the entire body in part or in whole refers to the study of kinesics. Okay. Now, postures come under this uh, category. So, posture simply refers to the position in which you hold your body when standing or sitting. But then look at the pictures I have put. 
why somebody prefers to lean on the wall, why somebody prefers to stand erect, why somebody is bending the head, why somebody is slouching, why somebody is leaning back, why somebody is walking as if there is pain in the neck. So, postures convey impressions of self-confidence, status, interest, lack of interest, etcetera. So, this is part of uh, kinesthetics. Gesture is again part of kinesics. What is gesture? If you look at the dictionary, it simply says that gesture is a movement of a limb or the body as an expression of thought or feeling. So, anything that you do with any part of the body, usually you gesture using your hands just to express a thought or a feeling that is gesture. But the tricky part of gesture is that most of the gestures have cultural background, which means they vary from one culture to another. Something that is good in western culture, the same gesture may not mean the same in south asian culture and vice versa. So, how do you know they are learnt within the society and culture to which one belongs? Gestures either accompany spoken language or stand alone in conveying a particular message. So, example, when a, a teacher or a project manager is trying to explain something, so he or she may use a map and then point out a place on the map while speaking about a site, but then may use certain other kind of uh, hand gestures which may vary from one culture to another. Okay. The next one that you need to pay more attention is the face. In fact, it is the most predominant uh, indicator in terms of body language. It is the most powerful channel of nonverbal communication. We indulge in an encoding decoding process while using facial expressions for communication. Even in the most simple interaction, we focus on the face. Okay. And we know that if the person is not showing the face or if we are not interested in looking at the face of the person, then something is wrong in the communication. It is not a genuine communication, some kind of dishonesty is there, somebody wants to hide something to the other or there is the likeness is less in the relationship and so on. So, face gives clues to attraction. So, if you are attracted to somebody, you want to look at the face of that person forever and ever. Interest in relationship. So, you like the expressions of the uh, other person, you want to watch this person all the time. Display of emotions, identity, background, age, even the body constitution which is referred to as humor and subtext. What is hidden? is again will be shown on face when you are in a face to face communication. Now, other interesting things about uh, facial expressions is that universally as uh, defined by Paul Ekman, there are six basic facial expressions which people accept everywhere, okay. but depending on the culture people try to have more expressions than this, but the basic ones anger, disgust, fear, joy or happiness, sadness and then surprise. Okay. Now, most of the times people look the same when they are happy or when they are afraid or when they are surprised or when they are uh, in sadness or disgust. So, invariably the expressions look same, but when you look at eyes, look at some of the random pictures of eyes which I took and then I have put here, do they tell you the same story? Okay. The eyes, eye movement, the eye gaze okay. increasing in uh, contraction, decreasing can all tell you something about the person about what the person is thinking and that exactly is the science by name oculusics. 
which indicates the study of gaze and eye contact. Now, gaze is the term used to mean looking at a person. Eye contact means mutual gaze, when the two look at each other at the same time. Okay. Maintaining eye contact signals genuineness, avoiding it signals shiftiness. So, it is important to maintain eye contact whether in formal or informal relationships. And the level of gazing or the intensity of gazing can vary according to cultures. For example, Americans are taught to look directly, whereas Japanese and Koreans and even most of the Indians are taught to avoid direct eye contact. Direct eye contact to them is considered a weakness in uh, case of Koreans and all that. It may even indicate some sexual overtones. However, shy people, timid people cannot hold eye contact for more than just a few seconds without glancing away. So, they look at you, but they, they want to take the glance away from you, because they are shy. By nature, they are very timid. This is where you should not jump into conclusions by looking at the person and deciding, oh, the person is not maintaining eye contact. So, this person is actually trying to cheat me. It does not mean that, it does not imply that uh, he or she is lying or trying to cheat you, but she or he is merely intimidated by the presence of the person with whom they are speaking. So, that you should also give contingency to this aspect. Now, again uh, there are some tricky issues with relation to eye contact. We have this voluntary dimensions and involuntary dimensions. As I said at the outset of this lecture, voluntary dimensions are not going to create problems, but involuntary dimensions are the ones we should be wary of. What is the voluntary dimension? It indicates friendliness, so when you maintain eye contact, respect, you can show respect on your eyes and uh, people uh, like the other person, when lot of respect is shown in the eyes of the other person interest, even comfort, okay. people who are kind, they just their eyes are uh, showing you a lot of comfort, but the people who are powerful can even show domination just by staring at you and then just by making you feel that you are inferior and then they can even do that. But these are all voluntary dimension, people think about it and then express that through their eyes. Even the duration of maintaining eye contact, frequency, the number of times, meeting or not meeting. So, all these can mean something. So, the simple example is like the boy and the girl, both of them are standing in the same bus stop. So, initially they uh, have not even seen each other, suddenly the boy uh, just turns around and finds the girl and then he just glances at her. No, second time he uh, uh, glances at her, but then third time she notices. Now, frequency, how many times they are looking at each other? Whether they are looking at each other or only the boy is interested? And then the duration, so next time when he glanced at her, the time increased and then when she looked at him, again she uh, looked at him, gazed at him for quite some more time. Now, this shows obviously interest and not doing this can show disinterest. Again to continue with the voluntary dimensions, in terms of persons whom you like, you want to increase the duration and frequency, but we avoid eye contact with strangers. Even in physically close situations as in a lift, so what we do is we will stand and we will try to look up or we will look at the side, but we will not look eye into eye. But with known person, if you do that it shows we are lacking in interest in talking to the person. 
children are very sensitive towards eye contact and they are even possessive with regard to their mother's eye contact. So, when the mother keeps the child in her lap and suppose the mother watches the TV or looks at someone the other side, what the child will do is it will try to turn her face around and try to make her look at the child. Okay. So, so much sensitive the children are and even in terms of news reading, so it will be very uninteresting to listen without eyes meeting. So, even uh, uh, this uh, news readers when they are reading, actually they are trying to maintain eye contact with you by uh, trying to look into the camera and then trying to make you feel that they are maintaining the eye contact. So, that is actually trying to make the entire discussion, the news reading interesting. Good speakers, so they manage to give the feel of looking at all of the audience. I will talk more about maintaining eye contact when we go to public speaking and our presentation skills, but right now you remember good ones they try to maintain this eye contact. Now, looking at the involuntary dimensions, we have something called dilation and contraction of pupils. Now, dilation happens that is the eyes bulge out as if I have put in the pictures. So, these uh, eyeballs come out okay, as if they come out, they dilate when they see objects of interest and they contract, okay, they, they become small in size when they lose interest or when they are feeling bored. They do this when they even feel sleepy because boredom slowly uh, make them feel sleepy also. So, smart people especially manipulative sellers, what do they do? So, they use this to measure customers preferences. So, they use it to attract and retain clients. So, ladies when they go and then they want to buy saris for example, so the customers will throw the sari, display it and they keep looking at their eyes. So, whether they are uh, in uh, contraction or in dilation. So, if the eyes grow in size like enlarges, they know that the lady is interested. So, then they will say oh this is a very uh, costly one only one piece is there, I cannot give any discount on this. At the same time they look at the ladies contracted movement when she looks at another sari, they will say oh this one I can give you any amount of discount uh, that is possible, if you want I can give you this, but not this one. Because they know that she is interested in buying this at any cost. So, they actually try to uh, do this, they manipulate uh, people. So, so much so about eye contact. Let us look at haptics that is touch, which is actually the use of physical contact when communicating. Now, touch obviously is one of the very first nonverbal symbols a newborn baby is lovingly exposed to and continues as major means. In fact, it is touch by touching the mother and by touch. Okay, and then putting everything in our mouth and feeling by touch, we learn things. But the meanings about touch are actually imposed by culture. When you grow up, you realize this. Take a simple example, a male guest visiting the lady of the house in Latin American countries will give a hug. In European countries will shake the hand or kiss her hand gently. In India, we say Namaste. In Arabian countries, they are not even allowed to see the lady. Again in India, men walking hand in hand shows friendship. Even they can put hand on the other person's shoulder, okay, they can hug each other and walk together, they can eat on the same plate, but in Europe or in America, so it can indicate that they are homosexuals. In India, again touching the feet of elders, it is indicated as a normal thing to show respect. In again America for example, it might appear to be slavish and it might embarrass an American, 
the typical one who has no idea about Indian culture, if that person is your boss, if you want to take the blessing on the very first day and go and touch, the automatic response of the boss will be to go back and you would think, what are you doing? Okay, something atrocious for the person. So, this is something that you should uh, keep in mind, this uh, cultural uh, issues also with regard to non-verbal behavior. Haptics in terms of human touch, as I said, it is the first form of communication by infants. The development as a healthy adult depends on the amount of touch received as an infant. So, they say psychologically, if the a person received less touch by the mother. So, the person gets into lot of psychological complications. Touch is also used to comfort a crying baby. Have you not seen the mother just patting or uh, just even touching okay, and then giving warmth to the baby? Touch is also used to comfort an adult. Most of the counseling sessions, the therapeutic part of counseling sessions, people just come and then gently pat or they uh, give some kind of massaging touch on the head. So, they make the uh, person feel comforted even by touch. So, touch has that power, but you should also use it professionally to give the most powerful meaning that you want to convey, especially in terms of handshake. Ask how you are giving the handshake. So, you will realize what kind of meaning you want to indicate by the handshake and again that is slightly distinguished in terms of uh, the culture. Americans for example, use a firm solid grip, Middle Easterners and Orientals prefer a gentle grip. A firm grip to them suggests as unnecessary aggressiveness. Aggressiveness is like uh, putting your entire force and then they think that uh, rather you are uh, trying to show that you are stronger than the other person, that rather that you are trying to be very dominative, so you are trying to show your power. So, it is better to avoid unnecessary aggressiveness, but in terms of professional communication, you should avoid two extreme types. It should neither be the dead fish nor the knuckle grinder. So, the dead fish handshake is like when somebody is so nervous, okay, the hand gets so cold, the other person gives the hand, but this person let us say a big celebrity or something and the other person is so afraid of even giving hand. So, the person gives it and then as if it is dead fish, okay, you cannot hold it, it is just coming out quickly, cold, wet slippery, nervous, okay. whereas the other extreme is this knuckle grinder. So, the handshake is given so powerfully that the knuckles are being ground, okay. that grinding the knuckles is again putting the other person into discomfort, showing that you are very strong and then you like the person so much, but in professional parlance, uh, these are not acceptable. It should be a firm handshake, okay. neither this dead fish nor this knuckle grinder, but it should be a gentle, but firm one. Okay. That firmness will indicate okay, you are interested in the relationship. That is about haptics. Let us look at proxemics, that is the use of space. How do we use space in terms of maintaining distance and proximity, that is closeness. So, the distance conveys a non-verbal message, the way we use space to communicate. For example, the richer a person, the more important and greater the person, the space will be occupied by that person. So, the richer he or she is, the more space he or she will occupy. Take small examples, train, aircraft. So, the person who pays more gets maximum space, maximum leg space, even in, uh, in flight, even you can sleep okay, in the executive class. So, in the economy class, even putting your legs are very difficult. Same thing with train. So, first easy, you get more space, more comfort compared to unreserved. 
cramped space, okay. bigger houses. So, houses in slum areas, houses in colonies, flats in uh, uh, big uh, uh, residential areas and then somebody owning an island and having a very big bungalow and villa or castle set up in uh, the island. So, depends on the money, depends on the power. So, the more richer, so the person wants to show how greater the person can occupy space. But uh, in terms of gaining respect, the rule that goes by the proverb familiarity breeds contempt applies here. That is, uh, if you are a professional and if you want to, if you are working with colleagues, subordinates, so the distance that you maintain and the less appearance you give, so will give you some kind of respect. The more you try to reduce it, so the more uh, you, you become intimate, the respect level may reduce formally, it may become informal, but if you want to maintain that formal respect, it is uh, important that you also try to reduce this uh, familiarity, not that much. Now, the extent of space that is in terms of the importance, the degree of formality, so that also indicates something. For example, let us say the husband and the wife, so they, uh, the husband is always driving the car and the wife sits in the front on the left seat, but suddenly the wife takes back seat on a particular day. So, this does uh, indicate that there is some kind of communication gap between these two. So, that is why she has taken the back seat, but again you should not jump into conclusions. It is also possible that the doctor advised her based on her health conditions not to sit in the front because she is vomiting frequently. So, the doctor told her to sit in the back, but other than this physical health conditions, if normally she is sitting back, it might indicate that they quarreled that morning. Similarly, bigger the leader, the larger the area will be sealed. You can see if the chief minister or the prime minister is going to visit, so more space will be covered between the common people and the VIP. And greater the honor when they come near and shake hands, you cannot go and close the gap, but then they can come and then if they want to show that they are very intimate with you, they can come and uh, shake hands with you. Similarly, sitting on a park bench, generally when we sit, we try to leave space for the strangers. We do this when we are sitting on the railway station uh, platform benches also, but we do not do this when a friend comes. So, we try to close this uh, space, so to show that we are uh, intimate with the person. When physical space is not available, what do we do? we create psychological space. Take for example, overcrowded lift, overcrowded electric trains, overcrowded buses. What do we do and especially we are surrounded by strangers. So, we tighten our muscles, shrink ourselves and then just like a statue we stand and then we, we just uh, as if we have closed our body. So, we act before the others. So, look at the picture like in uh, crowded culture, even if people are together, they try to avoid eye contact and they try to show that they have shut their uh, body space completely. Now, the next aspect of uh, distance you should uh, know is in terms of territory, in terms of the interpersonal distance that we maintain. There is basically this public uh, space, then social, personal, intimate. Now, the public one is the last one I have put in the slide that is close. If you want to maintain a close public interpersonal distance that is from 12 to 25 feet, but if it is far, it is 25 feet or greater, especially when the PM or CM is trying to address the gathering. So, more uh, distance is maintained. The social one normally in some occasions, wedding and all that. 
you are uh, interacting with people. So, when you are close, it is 4 to 7 feet, when you are slightly far away, it is 7 to 12 feet. But in personal relationships, so uh, marital relationships, friendships, colleagues, close friends and all that. So, the far level is 2 and a half to 4 and a half feet, but the close level is between 1 and a half to 2 and a half feet. The intimate level is 6 to 18 inches or often the level in which you can touch, literally brush your shoulders. So, that is the intimate level. Now, what happens when the boss tries to reach the personal level and then slightly tries to encroach on the intimate level, if the other person, the worker does not like it, so then there will be resistance. So, you can also visualize this in terms of uh, circles, public space, social space, personal space and then intimate space. And what happens when somebody invades somebody else's space? So, the reactions are we will show on face, on body through gestures, through body movement that we are feeling troubled, we will become defensive and some people will even become aggressive, some people will even retaliate. So, they will try to fight back, they will try to even hit back when somebody comes so close, they push the other person literally.